Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought-provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews, where we delve into the pressing issues that shape our municipalities from across Canada. Today, we are delving into a development from Hanwell Rural Community in the province of New Brunswick. Now, on July 19th, a pivotal decision was made that would have far-reaching consequences for Hanwell Councillor Pat Septon. In a 4-2 vote, Septon was suspended from council for a staggering 90 days, a decision stemming from his alleged breach of the council's code of conduct. Councillor Darren McKenzie brought forth the suspension motion, shedding light on the extent of alleged misinformation that had been spread by Councillor Septon. Councillor McKenzie passionately spoke about the undue stress caused to councillors and municipal staff by this situation. He expressed his frustration by saying, quote, a reasonable person would stop when local people are telling them they're doing something wrong and reevaluate what they're doing, but not in this case, unquote. Councillor McKenzie pointed that this should serve as a cautionary tale for other municipalities. He pointed out how Councillor Septon had ventured into podcasts to spread alleged misinformation, including a recent appearance on our very own cross-border interviews, episode 589, released on July 6th. Now, in light of this development, we reached out to Hanwell Rural Community, seeking clarity and understanding on this matter. We invited Hanwell Mayor Dave Morrison to appear on our show to discuss the events leading up to the July 19th vote and the impact these last seven months have had on their community. Now, today we are sitting down with Mayor Morrison to gain insights into how the suspension unfolded and what the council is doing to resolve the issue. We will also be looking ahead discovering Hanwell's plan and aspirations for the remainder of 2023. With an open heart and sincere desire to shed light on this matter, Mayor Morrison shares with us the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for Hanwell. So stay tuned for a candid conversation as we unravel the events that led to the July 19th vote and learn what the future holds for Hanwell. So here is our exclusive interview with Mayor Dave Morrison. Dave, I want to start with the big question. So on July 19th, uh, literally earlier this month, your council, the Council of Hanwell Rural Community, if I'm pronouncing that right, or if I'm getting the name of your community right, um, voted four to two 
to suspend Councillor Pat Septon uh, from council into until the first day after the first meeting in October, if I if I'm getting that correctly. Um, and as you know, and as some people who've listened to my show know, we had Councillor Pat Septon on the show earlier in July. And I want to know from your standpoint and from the standpoint of Hanwell, um, what transpired to lead up to this July 19th vote where we saw Councillor Septon suspend it? Yeah. Well, it's it's, uh, it's certainly a long story. It was a, a 90 day suspension. It just happens that the 90 days come up the day after the meeting. So that the day after the meeting or the meeting date had really nothing to do with it. 90 days is 90 days. But this has been a, an ongoing issue with uh, Mr. Septon since actually before he was elected. He had a little tuffle with the former mayor of uh, Susan Gassy, was the former mayor of Hanwell here. And that was where uh, he got into she had a, there was a racket going on with garbage collection. We had switched providers and we got a new uh, contractor. He had a, you know, a truck and a trailer, old school, not one of the fancy new, uh, you know, garbage trucks with a lift on it and all that. And some people didn't like that for a variety of reasons. They couldn't, uh, you know, they couldn't put loose trash in their uh, dolly. The, you know, we have a lot of people have the garbage dollies. It's a big green bin or black bin or whatever that you put your garbage in. And the, the guy the you know the guy that does it now he picks it out of the thing before the guy had the truck with the big lift on it he just grab the dolly and flip it in the uh, flip it in the you know the, the garbage truck itself anyway there was some kicking about that some people thought that you know it's just uh it just didn't look good some people thought that it uh, the big kick was they couldn't put loose garbage in but in our bylaw we have that garbage has to be bagged it's as simple as that and the bylaw has been there since before I came so anyway so that was a uh, the former mayor had a, a letter that she put on the Facebook page. Just everybody loves the social media these days. And no, Septon, you don't. You don't say, Dave. I, I don't. I stay away from it because I mean, people can say they can. You don't know who you're talking to. Sometimes they can say whatever they want. It's a great spot for keyboard warriors. So anyway, Mr. Seppin got a hold of that letter and he didn't like it, so he uh, rewrote the letter. But unfortunately, he had the mayor's name to it, and the mayor took great exception to that and didn't like a letter out there online with her name on it and really i i can't say that i blame her so she had uh our our lawyers that we normally hire cox and palmer great firm out of fredericton send him a kind of a cease and desist letter to his door delivered to his door so that kind of started the ball rolling with uh mr septon and he he says here in one of his letters of why he wrote this is interesting I ran for council because I was served during the height of the pandemic on January 27th, 2021, to my door, a legal cease and desist letter for commenting as a citizen about the garbage pickup, legal action against a citizen using taxpayer dollars for expressing reasoned dissent. Anyway, so I do indeed have a healthy skepticism for this body. That's why he ran for council. Now, most people on council run for council because they want to... Uh, you know, do the best they can for the community and move the community forward. People, most people go as council or mayor or whatever for, I always call it the right reasons. Like I'm there to do the best I can for hand one and, and so are most counselors. So that's kind of where he started. He, he came in with, uh, I guess, a chip on his shoulder. I remember from, from day one when he started, he wanted to be paid right away. And said, well, I said, you know, Pat at the time, I said, you know, you'll be paid when? the council, the new council has its first meeting. I said, I referenced them to the uh, Local Government Act. And the Local Government Act says that all council has control till new council has their first meeting. That's that's the rules. That's the way it is. And as mayor, I'm not going to pay, you know, for two councillors to uh, serve in the same position. It's just not fair to the taxpayers. To I don't care if it's for a week, 10 days, whatever. You're not going to double pay. So I said, wait and see. And, you know, when when we have our first meeting, you'll be paid from that date forward. As you can imagine, that didn't go over that well. So, anyway, uh, but Pat always says he never forgets, or he never he should say he never forgets anything. But he always says he lets things go. Well, it's new. He still brings it up to this day. And then we got in on another uh, <coughs> deal with the clerk that, <coughs> that he was passing her quite a bit. So he ended up going to uh, harassment. Went to lawyers and had a. Uh, harassment looked into and the lawyers came back actually we had a complaint from the clerk and a complaint from the assistant clerk 
on harassment. One was uh, found a small harassment, and one one was not. So uh, we worked through that, and he apologized for the to the clerk and said he wouldn't do it again. But a few months went by, and we got into uh, like we have a code of conduct that's legislated here in New Brunswick. The, you know, the government body says we have to have a code of conduct. We didn't have one a few years ago. Who would ever think a little community would ever need one? Boy, were we ever wrong. So, you know, we put in a code of conduct, basically got our information from other jurisdictions that had code of conduct so we could get one written. We had some help writing it. So we got a code of conduct in. And the long story short, in the fall of 2022, there was a lot of things happening with uh, Councilor Septon at the time. And counselors went to the, you know, several counselors went to the clerk at the time and were complaining about, you know, this has to stop, that has to stop, it's hard on us, we're, you know, again, so at the time on an informal complaint, the clerk looks into it. So she looked into it and brought, you know, 26 complaints or 25, 25, yeah, 25 complaints. You, you said 25 during the council meeting, so I'm assuming it was 25. Yeah, it was 25 complaints, like breaches of the code of conduct brought forward. Now that's 25, not one, two, three, 25 <laughs> that were brought forward to council. Council looked at them all. Uh, we gave them the bin for the doubt on six of them. Six, we said, well, you know, yes, no, but we'll err in favor of his. But 19 were clear cut breaches of the code of conduct for a variety of reasons we'll get into later on. So we put out sanctions uh, to Councillor Septon, and there was some feedback from a, 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 a councillor and a, well, two councillors actually, that they didn't like the process, they didn't feel it was fair, where the council was the sole judge, jury, and executioner. But that's it. That's the way it works in New Brunswick. There's no other board to go to, and local government will tell you things begin with council and end with council. So it's unfortunate there's there may be some bias in there, but that's the way it has to go. But anyway, there was such a pushback on it from two in particular that we said, okay, maybe we can go to a third party, go to an outside party and, and let them review and come back with uh, to see if we follow the right process or if the if the uh, you know if if the code of conduct was breached or if the sanctions were correct. So anyway, we went uh, to an, another lawyer that we never used before. That was uh, I know it wasn't Cox and Palmer. I got I got to think of their name. Put a put in a, a promo for them. Oh, goodness. but but I, but you went to a different lawyer that you yeah. had originally gone to. That's right. We want to be completely third party. It was people we don't even know. So we went to McGinnis Cooper, which is a firm in Fredericton here that we were when we checked around. They were very good on HR issues. So we went to those guys, and they said, "Fine, you know, we can look after this for you, or we can put it out to our affiliate in Nova Scotia that's called MC Advisory." They specialize in this type of thing, HR issues, and they said it would be a lot more economical for Hanwell to go to these guys than pay lawyers $350, $400 an hour to do an investigation. He said, you know, it'll end up saving you quite a bit of money. And we kind of thought, well, hey, you know, why not? This is what they do, and we're after a third party. So this was a group from Nova Scotia, and he was called, actually, he was called MC Advisory. MC meaning McGinnis Cooper, I guess. And that was a fellow by the name of, uh, let's see, yeah, Roly King was his name, Roland King. So we never heard of him. So anyway, we we had you know, some phone conversations with him, some emails back and forth, whatever, and we uh, engaged him to have a look at this. So he did a report looking at the, uh, at the code of conduct, the process, the whole thing, you know, I don't know if you want me to get into this with any depth or not. You uh, you do what you need to do because I want this is your time to talk. Uh, I, I had the ability to give a uh, counselor Septon his chance to say his uh, his two cents on this. So if you want to go into this as de de deeply as possible, you go right ahead, Your Worship, because right. I, I want you to make sure that you are giving my viewers and my listeners the most accurate information that you have available to you. And while you're doing that, um, I, I want you to start thinking about the follow-up question I'm about to ask. Um, this has been going on since 
hypothetically, since the third party investigator was hired in early 2023, so earlier this year, the sanctions began in fall of 2023. Um, has Hanwell become a standstill community because of the issues that are going on in it well, internally? It's yeah, it's certainly in impeding what the council would like to get done, because I mean we've got uh, one of the things that uh, Councillor Seppin did is he had anybody he knew, any friends, family, whatever, uh, write our tipper requests. And our tipper requests, that's the Right to Information Act, so they they can ask for anything. But some of the, some of them, we had a dozen, at least a dozen, maybe even more. Some take maybe a couple of days. Some can take two or three weeks. To I've been right. on the receiving on end of some of those, and I know so that know they also. they could take a long time. So that's the time up staff's time, uh, the deputy mayor's time, my time, and even even other councillors' times. Because when you're looking for stuff, you have to go through. They want information, so you got to go through every email you had to try to find it. And heaven forbid you want want to miss something to get hung out to dry on. But anyway, this is this is what's been going on. I mean, yeah, we've been getting things done, but things are sliding. Things are uh, again. This is uh, some councillors have said they look at their they want to quit because they they didn't sign up for this. They want to you know they want to do what councillors normally do. And staff, I've had the you know the the CAO and the clerk both wanting to talk and wanting to resign. But so far, I've kept the you know kept the the crew together. And we're we're moving forward and we're getting things done. I want to talk about that a little bit later, but I want to throw it back to the firm that you hired from Nova Scotia to come in and do the third party investigation. And I want to know what did they find? Okay. What what okay. did they find? Because we, we're gonna be talking about that about that a few minutes from now, but I want to know what did the third party of MC, if I'm not mistaken, is uh McGinnis Cooper uh find when they did the uh third party investigation was the 20 uh 25 uh violations of the code of conduct uh upheld or were they not and were they a range of harassment like what type of uh, code of conducts are we talking about here okay for uh i can start here with one for instance <laughs> this is the uh like when you look at the at the code of conduct, like section ten reads as follows: All members of council have a duty to treat members of the public, one another, and staff with respect and without abuse, bullying, or intimidation, and to assure that the work environment is free from discrimination and harassment. Members of council must in, ensure compliance with the New Brunswick Human Rights Commission and WorkSafe NB. In reviewing the specific posts and emails, I have the opinion that the respondent was disrespectful and intimidating on several occasions. The respondent should have reasonably known that the comments uh, would be taken as offensive. I have concluded, based on his explanation during the interviews, that he does not believe he must ask respectfully if he believes it to be true. Further, his threat should be taken. Further, his threat should be taken as intimidating and abusive to counsel. I have concluded that uh, this section has been violated. So that's uh, that's the, one of the sections. Uh, moving on, no member of counsel shall maliciously or falsely harm the professional or ethical reputation or the prospects of staff or other members of council. The respondent does not believe harming reputation with public comments is wrong. In reviewing the documents and statements made by Councillor Septon, I believe he was that he has harmed the reputation of staff in council. I further have concluded that it was at time malicious or false as he was providing information in many circumstances that contradicted his statements, yet he continues to make them. I have concluded that this section has been violated. Section 12E reads as follows. Council shall not use or intimidate to use their authority or influence for the purpose of intimidating, threatening, coercing, commanding, or influence any staff member with intent to interfere with the person's duties, including the duty to disclose improper, improper activity. I have considered the emails and posts and note that the respondent has repeatedly threatened council with further attacks in his interview. Councillor Septon made clear that he would continue to attack council in the public. For these reasons, I have concluded that this section has been violated. <laughs> These, this code of so conduct. I, I, I'm getting a I'm getting a pattern here. 
Yeah. Um, so in the July 19th meeting, Councillor Septon said that he felt like he was being attacked with all these code of conduct violations. And in your response to him, when you uh, relinquished the chair to your deputy mayor and then you became uh, just a person around the table, you said that it's the furthest thing from the truth that he is under attack. You, you were just trying to work together to move the community forward. I want to know from you, and I just uh, to pick up on your comments on that after just saying some of those things, uh, how, how do you work with someone who has been found, who still do, does what they are doing and still respect the democratic process that you have? He's a duly elected person. Even if he was acclaimed, he was duly elected and you have to work with them no matter how challenging it can be sometimes. Yeah. Well, he has a vote like any other councillor. Yep. And he, he can speak, uh, you know, we've always opened the floor anytime we have debate. Uh, I encourage debate. And I, I, you certainly don't want uh, everybody to follow whoever. I mean, you've got to have an open mind. You've got to be independent. That's what you're there for, to put forth your opinion. And he does that freely. And I respect that, like everybody else does. So he, you know, he has that opportunity like all counselors do. But the thing is, with getting back to that, out of those 19 violations that council, you know, the violations on the code of conduct, uh, the private investigator or the independent investigator found him guilty of the 19. He also found that council did follow their procedure properly. We didn't do anything out of the way or offhand it. And that the sanctions that we provided to or we gave to uh, Mr. S Mr. Septon were fair and in keeping with the with the breaches. So so you know. when when that report came back to council, and I'm not sure if you can remember back to when it first came back, those two holdout, those two counselors who said we don't want to be judge, jury, and executioner, did yeah. they say, okay, we now have a third party that is willing to say what we're doing is correct, we're going to move forward, and we're going to say, okay, now it is uh, reasonable to put on these sanctions. And again, yeah. I, I haven't gone back that far. I want to know from you. And if you don't remember, please just tell me you don't remember, and I'm happy to try and yeah. figure it out no I, I remember even when we voted to suspend them we've had we had two counselors that didn't that didn't vote to suspend them uh one was saying that the uh that they weren't around when the violations took place because what what happened in january is due to government reform here in new brunswick we expanded the uh, municipality and we took in a, a very large portion of uh of the adjoining local service district which was called King, king's clear so we got two new wards and two new councillors in, in January. And I mean, I can understand where they're coming from, but I mean, all they have to do is you know, follow the reports and, and bring themselves up to date on it. Uh, one did, and he, you know, he agrees with council that this this is having an effect on council and he wants to move on and do the right thing. Uh, the other is saying that, uh, you know, they, they they just weren't comfortable voting a person in, susp in the, being suspended when they weren't there when it happened. I mean, hey, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, we, it could have went that, you know, could have went uh, only one vote in favor of suspending them. Who knows? Councillors have to carry that with them. And the other person, uh, why they voted the way they voted, I mean, they were quite... Uh, uh, vocal in in not agreeing with the process, so you know everybody has to answer to their own conscience. To me, when when a, when somebody's acting up, we have rules. Society has rules. You know, you people go to court all the time, and you you know you're you're either convicted or not. But you, you have to, to me, you have to do the right thing. So I don't know. 19, 19 violations of our code of conduct is extreme. One or one or two would be bad enough. One is bad enough and don't forget when this was going on when mr king was investigating this one this was an informal complaint and then a formal complaint came along and that had uh 10 violations of the code of uh, conduct and in the middle of doing this report it went to the the formal one has to go to uh outside investigator and they only have 30 days to do their investigation to get it back so he had the investigator, same guy, had to take this one on and, and work on this in conjunction with working on the other one. And he came back on that one and he found the counselor septum was in violation of six out of 10 possible violations. So that's where the 25 comes from, 19 violations and 25 violations. 
and there's there's a few people in the community that are saying, attaboy, Pat, we're behind you all the way, and good job, and you know, keep fighting. I don't I don't get it. I mean, you, you know, we have society has rules to live by. I mean, councils have rules to live by. You just can't go out and, and you know defame people and be mean to people and you know. I don't know. I'd like us. He's. I'm not sure if he knows actually. You know uh, what his functions are as a councillor. He has said it several times that he sees himself as the uh, overseer of council. Well, government's the overseer of council. If we step out of line, government will come in and they'll take corrective actions. All councillors are equal. Uh, the mayor is just a member of council. I'm. I'm the spokesperson for the for council, and if, you know I speak for council and council tells me what to say and what not to say basically but when council takes the vote that's the official you know position of council and councillors should follow that so i i i have met with many councillors and mayors who would say the exact same thing about that but i want to pick up on something that uh, uh mr septon said during our interview it's about uh and even it was mentioned during the july 19th meeting it was it's around confidentiality now, according to and I, I am one of the I'm one of these policy wonks that will go and actually read policy because that's what I do on my spare time. So I yeah, read the right. Hanwell uh, procedure policy for your council meetings, right. and I want to just pick up on one one item in the and it goes to what was going on uh, for one of the potential uh, violations of the code of conduct. Um, until a matter is formally presented, this is quoting the policy now, until a matter is formally presented at a regular special meeting of council and or a committee meeting, items of a sensitive personal or business nature will not be publicly disclosed by a council committee members or staff. Seems pretty simple. Pretty, pretty, straightforward. Seems pretty straightforward. Now, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to quote verbatim uh, what Mr. Septon would say, but I would assume that he would say he has the right to go out and talk to people about the issues that are going to be presented in front of council. What do you, how do you charge back at that? How do you battle back against saying you have the right to talk about things, just not about business matters that are in front of, until it's presented in front of council? That's right. Well, again, confidentiality is utmost because I mean, things are said sometimes that are confidential and they're, they're confidential for a reason. This one in particular, this goes back to the, uh, we started recording our council meetings and the council voted 100%, like no no dissension, no, you know, that was a full majority. Everybody voted to uh, record these meetings. So it's, it was being recorded for probably a few months and uh, Councillor McKenzie that was looking after the recordings and posting them on, we have a, an internet radio that we we have that we use to put things out there. So he had put it out on the, the recordings out on internet radio. And he was looking at them. And there was nobody looking at them. It might have been a couple of people looked at these things and they were taking up a lot of time. I'm one but, of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we were having a... It, it started it started on emails that uh, Councillor McKenzie said, look, he said, you know, I'm not going to record these meetings anymore. They're a waste of time. They're, it's taken up my time. I got to uh, record them and put them on. I'm just not doing it. So he said, I'm going to bring a motion forward to quit recording them because basically he wanted out. And this was in an email, again, confidential between councillors. Yeah. So it, it was going back and forth and they uh, said, well, you know, We'll in the meantime, staff will we'll work it out and see what else can be done. So I actually shut it down and I said, look, I said, you know, save your comments for a council meeting. This is turning into a debate and we can't debate an email. We have to have open, you know, open and transparency in public meetings. So I said, enough's enough. So it quit. But anyway, Pat got wind of it and right away he put it on his uh Facebook page, his social media, that look, you know, hey, council's brought a, a motion forward. And they're going to quit recording meetings and you got to get out there and you got to stop this and make sure you show up at a meeting. But like I said, that's, you know, that didn't happen that way. It was being discussed. And basically, Councillor McKenzie said he, he wasn't going to record them anymore. Find another way because he thought it was he was wasting his time. And, hey, he, you know, he works for a living. He He's an active participant in, in council. He has been on council since 2014, since the beginning of Hanwell, when it was first incorporated. 
So the man has a, a very strong interest in, in his community, which is commendable. But he found this a complete waste of time. So being discussed in an email and going out and all of a sudden putting it on your social media where the whole world can see is, is a breach of confidentiality. It goes, it goes against like you read earlier. So you just can't do that. But try to so, explain that to Mr. Septon. It's like, I may as well talk to this lampshade right here because that's that's the response I get. I'll do what I want to do. So I, I, I read that first part, which is 7A in the procedures bylaw for anyone who who's like me who actually wants to go read it. But I want to add an addendum to this because this is the part where I think this is, gets a little bit fascinating for me. The added eighth addendum to it added on October 12th, 2006, consequences of disrespectful actions. So this is added way before your time. I'm assuming, I'm not sure how long you've been on council and uh, Councillor Septon or uh, Mr. Septon's time. And it reads, and I'm quoting the policy here, when any member deliberately acts against council wishes, breaches confidentialities and or puts the council and municipality at risk of legal and or reputational harm, his or her actions will be result in a disciplinary action by council, which may include but not limited to verbal cautions, verbal or writing written warnings or dismissal from committee memberships. Now, it doesn't say anything around uh, pay, doesn't say anything about suspension of committee members. And I want to know from that standpoint, because you in your pol a policy, which I, I'm a big proponent of having everything written, so that way you can't say you're going off script, you say dismissal from com uh, committee memberships. What was the action that led to say, okay, we're going to roll back your pay because this is the first action for sanctions and then ultimately, which led up to July 19th, his suspension for 90 days until October. Well, it doesn't, it, it, I think if you go back and check the policy again, it says, you know, it's not limited to just the, to the above. Yeah, but so, not limited to. So yeah, it does, so it does it say opens, that. Yes. Yeah. It opens the door for, you know, additional fair and just sanctions. So the sanctions that were imposed on him were a public reprimand, a letter of reprimand, a suspension of Councillor Septon's remuneration as a councillor, a requirement for Council Septon to take training, social media posts and emails on the municipal Facebook page or email platform would require the approval of the mayor, apologies to the mayor, deputy mayor, assistant clerk, clerk principal of the school, and to council. So, you know, those are, to me, are reasonable sanctions. The... Uh, when you sit down and you don't follow any of them and you just deny that they don't apply to me and and I thought I thought sanctions or breaches were for either criminal or something more serious. I mean, you look at you look at the breaches, they're all serious. Like the ones that were not serious, we gave them the benefit of the doubt on. That was the that was the six we we threw out. But 19 serious breaches of the code of conduct has to be looked at seriously. The reason I ask that is because in the July 19th meeting. I think it was either you or Councillor McKenzie, put it point blank. If Mr. Septon apologizes, follows through on these uh, original sanctions that he was that were imposed on him in the first place, you guys would reconsider the suspension tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. But if nothing changes by that uh, 90 day period, that its suspension could be extended, correct? Yeah, sure. Uh, he has the option to follow the sanctions and then the suspension and the pay because his pay was or his pay counselors are not paid right it's not it's not considered a job he already took that to the department of labor here in new brunswick and they go back and say you're you're not a worker you're uh you know you're a counselor you're an elected body uh, they go, we pay income tax cr you know cra is not going to let you get away with anything but we don't pay pension we don't play ei so we're not considered employees so anyway that's what i'm getting off track here so all he has to do is, uh, you know, is follow the sanctions and, and you know, become a team player and be be part of council instead of fighting against council. Like I said, he was never attacked. And I say that that's the furthest thing from the truth. He, you know, he broke the code of conduct, bar none, and he was uh, appropriately penalized for it. That's the end of the game. There's no attack. He's attacked council. <laughs> we haven't attacked him. How do you foster a good working environment, not only with council, but with administration when you have something like this going on, uh, Dave? Well, like I said, uh, 
all the other counselors get along. We, you know, again, we disagree. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Myself and the deputy mayor disagree, but you move on from that. There's, you know, I always told counselors that you can't always get your own way. If the vote doesn't go your own way, move on. That's that's as simple as can be. Some counselors take it personally, and they don't like what, when somebody says no or they don't agree with them, and they just can't get over it. But that's not the way life works. Councillor McKenzie did say that there were times when administration would be leaving crying. Okay, I'm back. And, back. Yeah. and uh, as someone who's worked in administration in numerous provinces, and uh, I, I know that the the, the public relationship with administration can be sometimes hard on administration but when it comes to council members having a hard uh a relationship with administration it can be even daunting and it could wear on people's ability to do their job when you when this is going on how do you as mayor ensure along with your cao and your clerk or city manager uh ensure that your administration is looked after, that they aren't leaving crying from the office every day? Well, therein lies the, the you know, part of the reason for the suspension. Get him, got to get him out of here. Either he starts to, you know, play respectively, do his job properly, uh, figure out what a counselor is supposed to do, and, and stop fighting. I mean, just just move on. And really, I think, you know, most council members, maybe not all staff members, I mean, he has gone so far as as saying the, you know, that the uh, the uh, assistant clerk lied, the CAO uh, man maneuvered, uh, didn't, like I said, didn't write bylaws right. Uh, you know, she, he actually said one time that the uh, the uh, there was uh, the Yoho Lake Association had applied for money for a fireworks through the council, which we voted and gave it to him. But he had said that he, here he was trying to find safe passage for kids across the Hanwell Road, and the CAO and the deputy mayor were out on a private uh, on the on a in a boat in Yoho on a private party sponsored by. Uh, Handwell, handwell dollars. <laughs> that's that's pretty deep. I mean, that's man. That's just uh, hard to believe anybody would say that. So they took great offense to that. Uh, how they're going to get over it, I don't know. Most people are very forgiving, and if, if people want to come around and do the right thing, I, I'm sure they they'd ha they, they'd have a big heart and welcome them back into the fold. But I can't guarantee that. I mean, he's 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 hurt a lot of people in a, in a bad way. And uh, some sometimes people can get over that, and sometimes they can't. I mean, you know, I've got a pretty thick skin, and, and I, I realize that people sometimes you know say things that they shouldn't have said at the time, and it wasn't improper, and they they apologize for it, and, and uh, you know, a, apology accepted, and and move on. Like I've I've done things in the past that are were not proper, and I'm if I do something wrong, I'm the first one to step up and say, hey, look, I'm sorry, I, that shouldn't have happened. That was very unprofessional. You know what can I do to make it better? That's that's all you can do. I mean, once it's done, it's done. I mean, you can't, you know, you know, you unring you a bell. The old, uh, you know, what do you call that? You know, you're lashing yourself over the back, or you know, yeah. you cut your wrist and bleed for people. I mean, all you can do is say I'm sorry and mean it from the heart, and uh, and and move on from there. And they either accept your apology or they don't. But it's very very difficult right now for counselors and staff to uh, to work with Mr. Septon. So we figure a, a ninety day break from him may have some time for people to you know to mend their uh, their their hurt and and maybe you know and maybe move on. But he's uh, un, until he follows the sanctions and does what he's supposed to do and and, and starts working as a counselor again and treats people with respect. I don't see people you know having him back into the fold. So I. We'll I, I will... I want to talk about one last subject before sure. I let you go here. And I want to go to Hanwell as a community because I'm always fascinated to find out about communities across this country, because I will be honest until, uh, until Pat Septon came on the show, I did not know that Hanwell even existed to be honest. And I've learned more from doing this show, talking to counselors, talking to mayors than I could only imagine from reading a book. Um, so what, what's going on in Hanwell these days? What are the big pressing issues in your mind that now, and I, I hate to use this analogy now that the, the, not the, the 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 issues out of the way and I say that respectfully the 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 big thing is out of the way and now you can focus on 
what's going on in the community and sort of move forward. Because as you said, uh, there have been things that have been missed. What's going on in the community that you want to focus on over the next six months? Because you have the next half of the year left to sort of try to ensure that your community continues to move forward. So what do you have on the docket to make sure that Hanwell continues to grow, prosper, and become a place that people want to visit? Yeah. Well, this council has uh, th three years left in this mandate. Normally, councils are elected for four years and elections come along every four years. The last election we went in, and then, of course, along came COVID, and we went from four years to five years. Although, note, the provincial government stayed at four years. But that's a, they wouldn't let us have an election, but they had one. Anyway, that's a whole that's a whole other side issue. Let's not rehash COVID, Dave. <laughs> so here we are in government reform. So government reform came along last year. So that's been pushed from four years to five years. So we're looking at another five-year term. So we got three years left of this term. There's things we're working on. Uh, we're building a, a BMX uh, trail you know, over in one of our parks. Uh, we've, we're still working on it. We just put in a, a multi-purpose paved surface next to our building. We're working on that. That has to be finished up. Uh, a lot of landscaping to do along the edges. We've got to put a fence up. And that's going to be ready for, like, you know, pickleball is the big thing down here in the Maritimes now. Everybody's playing pickleball. Oh, uh, out in uh, our, uh, our newly acquired... Uh, boundaries along Kingslayer. There's some work out there to do to their multi-purpose paved surface. It's been in kind of in disrepair. It needs to be lined. It has to be worked on a bit. Uh, the ball field's in good shape, although we have to mow it. There's a soccer field has been let grown up in weeds and people use it for uh, a dog park, if anything. So we've got to get that in shape and start mowing that and repair the fence. Actually, somebody actually stole about 60 feet of fencing off of the back side of that soccer field. Go figure. <laughs> We have a, a nice set of trails out there that are just in behind the fire hall that have been, they were built probably, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. And like all the uh, the walkways and bridges, you know, over little wet areas and whatnot are all in disrepair. So there's something we'd like to get at. So there's all kinds of things in Kingslayer we want to get after uh, where they're now part of the community. And there's lots of stuff happening in, in Handball. We're putting a new uh, uh, neighborhood park out in Yoho. We finally got the the deed through in that, and we're going to have to, you know, clear the land and and uh, get some things done out there and put some trails in and maybe put some playground equipment in. Uh, we just acquired Gorman Park last year. A uh, little bit of work to tidy up with that. Uh, that's that's a real nice new asset for the community. Uh, the volleyball park, in, uh, which is in the Brookdale Recreation Park, I mean, that's uh, got to get some work done on it. So yeah, we've got lots of things to do, and we've got a uh, you know we've got uh, a couple of employees. We hired a new recreation director this year, and he's worked as a, as a student with council before here for three, if not four years, and he's fantastic. He's he's jumping right in with both feet, and he's organizing all things going on. We've got a, a sizzling summer social coming up this weekend, actually, and that's going to have like uh, oh there'd be cotton candy for the kids and a bouncy castle and some games and. All kinds of things going on for the young folks to get out and enjoy. We want to start concentrating on the uh, the teenage youth that really don't have a lot here in Hanwell to do. So we either have like a maybe a drop in center uh, when the weather when the summer's over, so they can go there and maybe play some games or something once in, once in a while, maybe once a week, twice a month, whatever. Uh, we wanted to have. I want to work on having uh, coffee and conversation with your counselor. Unfortunately, with the the coffee and the conversation with the counselors, have been more uh, <laughs> not happening when it should be. It's a lot of negativity going on, but with with a very small select few in the community, uh, most people feel that the you know the council's doing a good job. They're anybody I've talked to are quite happy, even with the garbage collection. They're they're not complaining that the uh, it's not a high end garbage collection truck that's picking them you know picking up the garbage. It's you know, most people figure if they put the garbage at the end of the street or the end of the driveway on a, on a Tuesday morning that it's picked up and they're happy with that. So, yeah, we're <laughs> the best we're thing about open. municipal governments. As long as the garbage is picked up, the water's turned on. I'm a happy camper. <laughs> and the taxes remain low. That's the that's key. That's true. That's the key. That's that, the third that's key. Everybody. Yeah. So, yeah, we've done a lot in the, in certainly since we've been become a municipality in 2014 when Hanwell became a rural community, we had nothing. We didn't even have a pencil sharpener. And that time we, uh, we rented a spot. And three and a half years ago, we had our own municipal building. We built a, a building with municipal offices on one side and uh, like a recreation hall on the other side. 
and that's been put to great use. We have things going on out there. We have uh, boomers are in. Uh, it's being rented out for weddings, anniversary parties, all kinds of things. And when we put an event on. It's the it's the spot because it's got a fully equipped kitchen. It's got a fully uh, equipped uh, audio system, audio visual with a drop down screen and great. You know, it's just a, a beautiful building. It's absolutely when you drop down here in a couple of weeks' time and you look me up, I'll certainly look forward to giving you a tour. And actually, if you have the time, I can show you around Hanwell Kingsler. It would be uh, as I long as there's a campground around, I will certainly take you up on that offer. <laughs> actually, there's a new campground just out in the Masserall settlement, which is in the part of the Kingsler LSD that we acquired. And that's right on Kelly Creek. And they actually have some glamping units there if you don't have your own uh, own trailer to haul. Oh, and it's the back what, of my car, so I will need a glamp. Yeah, there you go. I always, uh, for if you want to know where Hamwell is, I always say it's in, in a, with the with the delight of the mayor of Fredericton. I always say, well, Fredericton's just on the peripheral of Hamwell, so we're easy to find. <laughs> and she kind of uh, gives me a, uh, not a, a not a friendly <laughs> smile when I say that, but she takes it. Like Kate and I get along well. Kate Rogers, we work together. We have we have fourteen communities in the the. Uh, it's under the capital uh, used to be regional service commission eleven. Now it's capital region service commission. We have fourteen communities, but the communities are all linked together. There's Hanwell, uh, Village of Merriman, Town of Ormacht, and the City of Fredericton are all four that are work together. And we meet. We always meet together, you know, uh, quarterly for sure. And we we find out how we can help each other. We're we're very. We see what we can do for each other. Because I mean, there's uh, if if Fredericton's done something, we're going to do the same thing. Well, we can get some great ideas from them, and if uh, we can help them out anyway, we'll do so. So uh, the the four mayors get along very good together. We have we have some fun, and we enjoy each other's company, and that's the way it should be. The worst kept secret in municipal governance is we always steal the best ideas from the cities and from the other communities. So I can imagine if if someone's doing a better job, why not just take that idea? But I, I, want to, I, I want to ask one last question, and this is about you as mayor and as a person. Um, I can imagine when you got elected in 2021 in this term that you did not expect to deal with this issue. And we're going back to the code of conduct issues. Now, code of conducts have become a, good, a thing that a lot of municipalities are using. I've been seeing them pop up more and more across Canada, not just in New Brunswick, not just in the Atlantic, Can in Atlantic Canada, but across Canada. What advice would you give other mayors in your situation or who are about to go through your situation right now? Well, <clears throat> you've got to deal with it. You can't let it fester because uh, eventually it's going to implode or explode in some cases, and you're going to have some very unhappy people. If you know the the problem person has to be dealt with. And it's it's never easy. Like I worked in government for 37 years and I was a manager for the last 25. In HR are the hardest issues that you ever run across. You know, one person can monopolize your time. It can take up. It's just, it's ongoing. But when you're, mostly if, if people need, you know, they need a little guidance, they'll they'll take the guidance willingly and come around. Because let's face it, most people want to do the right thing. They want to do the, a good job, no matter whether you're a counselor or whether you're an engineer or whether you're a welder, plumber, pipe fitter. I mean, a surveyor goes on and on and on. People most of the time want to do the right thing, and uh, sometimes they they get a little off base, and you can you know get some corrective action, and they're back online and they're they're happy campers. But man, when you've got uh, somebody that's kicking over the traces continually and, and causing dissent within within the whole council and staff, it's just I don't know. I don't know. I, it's it's difficult to correct it when it's gone that far. So we we took corrective action before. But this is this is a unique situation that the the individual has not admitted to any wrongdoing, so I, I don't get it. I mean, you know, we all make mistakes. We're all human, and there's nothing wrong with making a mistake, and there's nothing wrong with owning up for it. That to me, that shows strength. I mean, it's not a, it's not a weakness to to admit to being wrong. It's a it's a strength, and it's a it's a quality that most people share. Because like the you know, well, I remember one of her head office ladies always said to me, I was ranting and raving about somebody. She said, now, Dave, she said, there's a, you know, there's a little bit of good in everybody. <laughs> so that's a statement to live by, right? Most people are, are you know, are they're fair and they, they, they want to do the right thing and they're happy with that. When you succeed, everybody succeeds. 
So it's a team and, you know, move with the team, be successful with the team, do the right thing for your community. And, you know, it, it just makes things a better place. Like Hanwell is a, I've been here for 34 years. I moved here from Miramichi, which is a, say a hundred miles to the kind of the Northeast from here. And when I come over here, I, I didn't know the area. I had been to Frederick a few times for some meetings and just outings and whatnot. But where on earth am I going to live? I'm moving here now and it's going to, I'm moving my family. And where am I going to go? And, I, you know, you look around. I looked at various places around and I came out to Hanwell and, and uh, met with a contractor. It was a, an older guy. And I just I just felt comfortable. I, I felt at home. And the, the contract of the day, Fred Ludford, bless his heart, the, he, he's got two subdivisions in here, one that I lived in, Brookdale subdivision, and the other one is Ludford subdivision. I had built two houses from that man. And all, both houses were built in a handshake. There was nothing signed, no contract. Wow. Everything was done as 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 I wanted it, if not better. Some things, you, you, you know, you, you say you'd like this, that. Uh, uh, it's just, that's the kind of deal to go on. And Could you said, imagine the housing market today if that was still around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has since passed, but I, uh, but I know him well. His his son uh, Brian has been plowing my yard for thirty five years, and he's he uh, he still plows my yard. I think he's they do the commercial stuff they have now. I don't even think he does any more driveways other than mine. <laughs> so a great family, and uh, Fred was a great guy to deal with. I mean, you you, you couldn't come across anybody any better, any more of a businessman. And like, you know, he just, he built his business from the ground up. He didn't, he didn't inherit it. He didn't buy it. He started out with nothing. And he built that business up to be a, a real goal of concern. So, I mean, he, you, he's. You, you've you painted a vibrant picture of Hanwell and I'm really looking forward to visiting later oh. on this month or next month in August uh, after this comes oh. out. Um, oh. But Dave, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy summer. And I know you are gearing up for a big weekend there in uh, Hanwell and Fredericton. But I want to thank Summer's you. For, so <laughs> I want to thank you so much for sitting down, taking which was supposed to be a half hour, turned into 45 minutes out of your busy schedule and doing this and sort of giving the other side of the story that uh, needed to be told. So thank you so much. Yeah, I've never been accused of uh, not talking enough. <laughs> Thank you so much to Mayor Morrison for joining us on this special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Now, all the information that was discussed in today's episode will be linked in the show notes. So if you want to go read the reports that Mayor Morrison was talking about, please scroll down and click on the links. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in and for being part of this conversation. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all future content that we have coming to you. Now, if you're able to also, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce more high quality content like you saw today. Every little bit helps and we appreciate your support. A link to our support page is in the show notes as well. And, and this is the most important thing. This will be our last episode and special episode for the next four weeks as we begin our tour to Eastern Canada visiting communities from across Canada who've appeared on this show. We're really looking forward to this next four weeks. Now, the cross-border interviews, though, will be returning on September 4th with brand new episodes and a special announcement on September 4th, a new addition to the cross-border interviews family will be premiering. So stay tuned to our website and social media pages in August for all the details. Thank you again for watching and listening. And until September 4th, just remember, just keep talking.